We're going to start with the next session. As I mentioned before, my name is uh, Curtis Smith, and I'm a, a professor of uh, pharmacy practice at Ferris State University College of Pharmacy, where I uh, received my BS degree, and then I received my doctor of pharmacy at the Medical University of South Carolina. I also did a fellowship at the University of Oklahoma in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, I practice in trauma surgical critical care. I do some things in internal medicine as well, and I still um, have uh, fondness for pharmacokinetics. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. So for, for some of you, this may be, um, you may come into this with fear and trepidation. You hated anything with numbers and, and uh, math and, and kinetics. Uh, but for others, maybe you're like me and you love these things and um, could do it every day. So I have no conflicts of interest uh, related to this particular presentation. These are the learning objectives. We're going to go over some basic concepts, a lot of things that I'm sure you all remember from uh, when you were in pharmacy school and things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in your practice probably. We'll talk about basic uh, concepts, do a little math as well at the beginning here. Talk about elimination rate constants, volume of distribution, clearance, and bioavailability. There are then some specific pharmacokinetic characteristics of commonly used therapeutic agents that we'll go over. That'll be towards the end of the presentation. We'll talk about patients with renal de disease and hepatic disease. And then uh, we'll also define some important issues as they relate to drug concentration, sampling, and interpretation, as that's very important in the realm of pharmacokinetics. Here's the agenda for what we'll go over for the next hour. As I mentioned, we'll start with some basic pharmacokinetic relationships, talk about uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, the four main pillars of pharmacokinetics. Talk a little bit about nonlinear pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenetics as well, non-compartmental pharmacokinetics, data collection and analysis. Uh, what about those patients who have renal disease or hepatic disease? How does it, that impact the pharmacokinetics of drugs? And then a little bit on pharmacodynamics at the end, which uh, occasionally pops up on the exam. Starting with patient case one, and as uh, I think most presenters have at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see the workbook page that I'm on related to this particular case. And then the answer is next to that, so if you want to flip back to the answer, um, feel free to do that. So this is HR. HR is currently receiving vancomycin from an MRSA infection, and the patient also has renal failure. The patient is given a one gram dose on March 21st. That's just a random date, don't worry about that. But it's given at noon. And then uh, a concentration is taken soon after the dose is given, and it comes back as 23.8. And then three days later, another concentration is taken, and it's 12.1. So the question is, if you were to give a one gram dose um, on that uh, second day, on March 24th, at 1600, when would you need to give the next dose, the third dose? One day after the dose on the 24th, three days later, six days later, or there's insufficient information to calculate when to redose. Ah, uh, so a lot of information. We're going to go by it step by step. Um, I, I noticed that as opposed to the previous speaker, uh, when I delineate what is the right answer, I just change the color. So on your black and white book, it, you can't tell uh, what's the right answer. So you can't cheat for my questions. I didn't realize I was doing that, but it's sort of a bonus. So um, a interesting, uh, not an interesting equation, a very common equation that really you should know, every pharmacist in my mind should know this equation, and that's a volume of distribution equation, which is the volume of distribution is, is equal to the dose over the change in concentration. And if it's the first dose, it's the dose over CP0. Uh, and that's a good relationship to know, and you can rearrange that equation to calculate a dose if you know the volume and you know the concentration you want. Or you can calculate the concentration if you know the dose and the volume. So in this case, we know the dose. It's 1,000 milligrams. And we divide that by the concentration, which we know, 23.8. And because it's the first after the first dose, we know it started at zero. So the change in concentration went from zero to 23.8. So that's why I have 23.8 in there. And our volume of distribution is 42 liters. Now, uh, here's another equation that hopefully you remember that is a very common equation, the equation for the elimination rate constant. 
Elimination rate constant is the change in the natural log of, of the uh, change in concentration. So natural log of concentration one minus natural log concentration two divided by the difference in time between those two concentrations. Um, or if you know the half-life, another common uh, pK equation that I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with and remember, half-life is equal to 0.693 divided by k. So you can calculate k that way as well if you know the half-life. In this case, we don't know the half-life in this specific patient. So k is equal to the natural log of the two uh, the uh, first concentration minus the natural log of the second divided by the change in time, which was three days or 72 hours, and we get a k of 0.0094. The change in concentration then we know was 23.8 when we gave a gram. So if we give another gram, it's also going to go up by 23.8. Um, and so that means that this concentration we have on March 24th, 12.1, we're going to add another gram, which will add another 23.8. And our concentration at the end of that second dose will be about 36 milligrams per liter. Um, and then this equation, um, which is uh, concentration is equal to initial concentration times e to the minus kT, another very common pK equation. And so we know we're starting at 36. If we want to give the next dose at 10, and you could argue that we want to give it at 15, whatever vancomycin concentration you want to give the next dose, I just use 10 in this example. And so we do this equation, and we know the k now, which is 0.0094, and we calculate a time of uh, 136 hours, or about six days. Now, another way you could do that is sort of just um, knowing in your, or thinking it through in your head, if we were at 36, one half-life, which we know the half-life is about 72 hours, because it went from a concentration of about 24 to a concentration of 12, one half-life is about 72 hours, so going from 36, one half-life would take that down to 18, so that would be one half-life for 72 hours, and then another half-life would take it down to nine, just cutting it in half both times, another 72 hours, so a total of six days. So the answer to this one is C, six days from the dose on the 24th, you are probably going to be ready to give another dose. Okay, this question is a little more straightforward. It's calculating a bioavailability. So following 100 milligrams of a drug IV and 200 milligrams of the same drug oral, the AUCs are 50 for after the 100 milligram IV and 25 after the 200 milligrams oral. So what is the bioavailability? 25%, 37 and a half, 50 or 100. So for this equation, um, we uh, know that bioavailability is equal to dose of the IV, so this, in this case 100 milligrams, times the AUC of the EV, which is the um, extravascular, and that could be if you're giving it orally or IM or sub-Q or some other non-IV administration, divided by the dose extravascular, in this case it was oral times the AUC IV. So you plug those numbers in, and you get a bioavailability of 25%. So the correct answer is A. And then finally, um, LB. LB is receiving tobramycin for pseudomonas pneumonia. LB has renal failure and is given a, a 160 milligram dose at 12 o'clock, and six hours later, a concentration is checked, which is six and a half, and then another concentration is checked 12 hours later at six in the morning, which is 5.4. So when LB's concentration is one, what dose is needed to achieve a peak of nine? 140, 160, 180, or 200? I'll start asking you to throw up cards after this question, but I'm not going to have you do that here. Again, we have similar equations that we've looked at before, so we can calculate the K, the elimination rate constant, by the same equation we used before, K is equal to the natural log of one minus the natural log of the other over the change in time. In this case, six and a half. Uh, and 5.4, the two concentrations. Now those, pharmacokinetically, those aren't um, ideal uh, concentrations because you'd like to have at least a half-life. 
between the two concentrations. So in other words, you'd like to have the second concentration down below 3.25, which is less than half of 6.5. These are really very close to each other. But those are the concentrations we have to work with, so those are what we're going to use in this particular example. Uh, again, the difference in time was 12, so the K is 0.015. We see also then that uh, we know that when we gave that initial dose in this particular patient, and then the concentration six hours later was six and a half, or five hours later was six and a half, we can then calculate what the concentration was immediately after the dose by that same equation, C is equal to C1. Uh, in this case, we flipped it around a, bit, a little bit, where CP0 now is equal to C1 divided by e to the minus kt, and we get a CP07. So at the end of that particular first dose, the concentration was actually 7. We know that first dose was 160 milligrams, so we can calculate the volume, which was equal to 160 divided by 7, or 23 liters. And we know then that if we want to go from a concentration of 1 to a concentration of 9, that change is 8, right, 9 minus 1, uh, is 8, so we want to increase the concentration by 8, and we know the volume is 23, so using that same equation, I've just manipulated it here, dose is equal to change in concentration times volume, so dose is equal to the change in concentration we want, 8 times the volume, 23, and we get a dose of about 180 milligrams. So the answer to this one then is 180 milligrams. So that's the last of the intense math I'm going to do um, in the next hour. But I think it's important to know those uh, simple, you don't have to know the real complicated equations, but know the simple equations that relate dose to volume, dose to concentration, how to calculate half-life, etc. Um, those are potential questions that you might see um, on the exam. All right, we're now going to go into ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. We're going to start with absorption. Just a few concepts, no question really about this, but a few concepts that I just wanted to review that you should be aware of. First, pass effect, which is that the blood perfusing the GI tissues passes through the liver before it gets into the systemic circulation. And then enterohepatic recirculation, which is something you can see in drugs that are cleared through the bile, and they get back into the gut where um, they can be metabolized back down to the original drug and then reabsorbed, um, and that's how you get that recirculation. All right, uh, question four, which uh, is not really a patient case, but I have it listed as patient case four. Um, and... If you have the handout, um, this is on page uh, 518 of the handout. Um, I believe it is, yes. So what statement best describes P-glycoprotein? P-glycoprotein is a plasma protein that binds basic drugs. P-glycoprotein transfers drugs through the GI mucosa, increasing absorption. P-glycoprotein diminishes the effect of CYP3A4 in the GI mucosa, or P-glycoprotein is an efflux pump that decreases GI mucosa and absorption. Any answers? Now I'm going to ask for cards or start asking for cards. All right, we have a few different colors coming up, maybe some B and D going on. So let's talk about P-glycoprotein. Uh, P-glycoprotein is one of the drug transporters. It's a drug transporter. It's part of the ABC superfamily, which is one of the two main superfamilies of drug transporters. Um, CYP3A4 and P-glycoprotein are both in the GI mucosa. Both of them are there to protect you. So when you ingest things that you shouldn't have ingested that potentially could kill you, they are there to prevent that substance from getting into your systemic circulation. Uh, 3A4 is ob obviously an enzyme. It's there to break down that, that potentially toxic substance. P-glycoprotein is an efflux pump that is there to pump it back into the GI lumen so that it, things are not absorbed. So it's an efflux, efflux pump. It works with CYP3A4 to prevent that absorption, but it pumps the uh, substance back into the GI lumen. Most 3A4 substrates are also P-glycoprotein substrates. 
Uh, and so if you want to know what potentially uh, might uh, interact with P-glycoprotein, you can uh, keep that in mind. And many of the CYP3A4 inhibitors or inducers also inhibit or induce P-glycoprotein, so they'll have similar effects. So an inducer would um, not only induce the metabolic activity of CYP3A4, but it would also induce the transporter uh, ability of P-glycoprotein, and so you get less drug absorbed. And there's some examples at the bottom that are P-glycoprotein uh, substrates. <clears throat> so the correct answer is D. It's an efflux pump that actually decreases GI mucosa. It doesn't increase absorption, it actually decreases absorption. All right, moving on now to uh, distribution. And uh, I mentioned this equation uh, right here, the volume of distribution is equal to dose over the concentration. Vi volume of distribution is not really a specific um, volume in the body. It's simply a constant that relates the amount of drug in the body to the observed concentration that we see in the blood. There's a few things that will uh, bind drugs in the body. Albumin is the primary one, but also alpha-1 gly uh, acid glycoprotein and lipoprotein. And P-glycoprotein also can have an impact on distribution because it's found in the brain and it's the, um, the transport protein that can uh, really prevent drugs from getting into the brain. Again, protecting your body from potential um, uh, toxic substances. In your handout, I have some uh, enzymes listed on page 519, enzymes that are involved in drug metabolism, oxygenase enzymes, conjugating enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes. They're just, um, they're just listed there. I'm going to talk in a lot more detail in just a bit about SIP enzymes. And then on page 520, there's a whole list on table four of drug transport proteins, the two major superfamilies of drug transport proteins, uh, SLC and ABC, P-glycoprotein being one of the ABC um, uh, drug transport proteins. Uh, they're all listed there, including where they're listed, where they are in the body and drugs that interact with those particular proteins. Probably a little more detail than you'll see on the exam. I guess you never know, but they're all listed there if you want to review those. All right, we're going to talk about SIP now. So the next case is patient case number five, which is on the top of page 521 in the handout. Uh, this is a renal transport, uh, transplant patient. The renal transplant patient also now has a CAP, community-acquired pneumonia. Patient is receiving cyclosporin. So which is the least likely uh, drug to interact with cyclosporin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, or all macrolides inhibit CYP3A4? All right, good. Got some good answers. We'll go over this right now. So what is cytochrome P450? It's a group of enzymes that are responsible for phase one metabolic reactions. I'm sure you remember phase one metabolic reactions. They're located in various parts of the body, primarily in the liver, but also located in the small intestine in um, a, a large concentration, and also some in the brain, the kidney, and the lungs. Usually drugs will have affinity for one CYP3A4 pathway, uh, but some of them utilize different pathways. So when we look at CYP enzymes, uh, CYP is the superfamily uh, that all these enzymes are part of. There's then a number after that CYP connotation. That number connotes the family, and any enzyme with uh, the same number is going to be at least 40% identical. So for instance, CYP2C19, CYP2D6, CYP2C9, they're all at least 40% identical. After the number then is a letter, that's the subfamily. The subfamily is, uh, if you have the same um, subfamily, then you are at least 70% identical. So CYP2C9, CYP2C19 um, are in the same subfamily, at least 70% identical. And then the isoform is just the number. So that, uh, you know, is the difference between CYP2C9 and CYP2C19. They're different enzymes. Uh, this gives you an idea, um, and these graphs are in, the, in your handout as well, but this gives you a little idea of the content in the liver. So in other words, if you were to um, crush up the liver and see how much of each of these particular enzymes are in the liver, 
that 3A4 predominates as the most common uh, enzyme in the liver, and the 2C enzymes then follow it and are in similar numbers. And then the rest are just a hodgepodge of the other um, enzymes, the most common ones, uh, 1A2, you can see there, 2EI, um, 2E1, sorry, 2A6. And then you can see over here 2D6, which is just a liver, little sliver of the concentration that we see in the liver of SIP enzymes. Now, if we were to take all the drugs that are metabolized through the SIP system and we were to list them all out and then look at the percent of um, those drugs that go through each of those enzymes, we would see again that 3A4 predominates. So that is the enzyme that's going to metabolize the, um, if you see there, about a third or 33% of all the drugs that are metabolized by SIP. And then the two Cs follow and they metabolize a significant amount as well. You can see here though that 2D6, which only accounted for a very small percent of the total concentration of SIP in the, ends, uh, in the liver, still uh, metabolizes a large number of drugs. It's really important on, in brain drug metabolism and heart drug metabolism, metabolism those drugs that work um, in the brain, those drugs that work on the heart. Uh, 2D6 tends to metabolize a lot of those drugs and it metabolizes a significant number of um, drugs that go through SIP. Now here's some characteristics of SIP uh, enzyme metabolism. One, inhibition is substrate independent, and that means that if a drug inhibits 3A4, it doesn't pick and choose which drugs, which substrates it's going to inhibit. Any drug that goes through 3A4 is going to be inhibited by that particular drug. So inhibition of any of the enzymes by a drug is not specific to another substrate. It'll inhibit all the drugs that use that particular enzyme. Some substrates are metabolized by more than one CYP450, and you can see that um, in uh, a few examples, some of which I have listed um, in your handout there. So you'll see tricyclics um, that are in, uh, uh, in um, metabolized by multiple SIPs, uh, SSRIs as well are in that same category. Um, enantiomers may be metabolized by different SIP enzymes. So the inactive enantiomer of warfarin is metabolized by 1A2, and the active one is metabolized by 2C9. So the drug interactions we see with warfarin are due to the 2C9 interaction, not the 1A2. Differences in, in, in inhibition may exist in the same drug classes, which gets back to the question that I just asked. Um, so unfortunately, you can't just lump all um, drugs in a class and assume that they are handled the same uh, through the SIP uh, system. So in other words, um, this is the case with H2 blockers, where cimetidine has a lot of SIP interactions, uh, ranitidine and famotidine not as much. Same thing with the azoles, where boriconazole, itraconazole, a lot of interactions, fluconazole, not as many interactions. And then in this instance, uh, macrolides are not the same. Erythromycin, clarithromycin interact with SIP a lot, azithromycin um, not at all. Substrates can also be inhibitors, and so um, sub, some of the substrates you'll, uh, you'll, you may see that a, you know, a drug is a substrate of 3A4, it's broken down by 3A4, it also inhibits. That's um, not uncommon at all. Most inducers, some inhibitors affect more than one enzyme, so that's especially the case with inducers, uh, where you uh, not only induce one of the SIP enzymes, but three or four of them. Things like phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarb fill in, uh, fall into that category. And finally, inhibitors may affect different enzymes at different doses. So fluconazole has strong inhibition of 2C9 at lower doses, but only affects 3A4 at higher doses of 400 or 800 milligrams a day. So getting back to this question, which I pretty much already answered, the correct answer is azithromycin, uh, but the, the point of the question is you got to be careful and you can't lump uh, a character, SIP characteristics of a class of drugs all into the same thing. Okay, a little bit about pharmacogenetics. I'm not going to spend a lot of times, uh, time on this. Pharmacogenetics is when more than one genetic variant, which we call an allele, so more than one allele is stable in the population. And it accounts for greater than 1% of the population. 
And uh, usually we then divide the population into poor uh, metabolizers and extensive metabolizers. But you can also see things like ultra-rapid metabolizers. But the two main categories are poor and extensive metabolizers. The big thing with pharmacogenetics is there an is there is that there is an anti-mode, which is again in your handout on page 523. And that's a clear differentiation between the poor metabolizers and the extensive metabolizers. And so if you look at 3A4, for instance, um, 3A4, follow, there are poor and extensive metabolizers, but it follows a normal bell-shaped curve. It's just sort of a wide bell-shaped curve. So on the left side, you have a lot of poor metabolizers. On the right side, a lot of extensors, uh, extensive metabolizers. But there's no anti-mode. It's just one big bell curve. In, um, in enzymes uh, or anything else that has multiple um, alleles that are stable in the population, there's a clear anti-mode between the populations. The phenotype is the clinical expression, so that's whether the patient is a poor metabolizer or extensive metabolizer. The genotype is the genetic composition, so you might have a patient who, um, you know, we will have two alleles for any of these particular genes. So you might have the SIP uh, 2D6 star 1 from your mother and the SIP 2D6 star 2 from your, um, from your father, and that's your genetic composition, those two things um, together. And then finally, these are some common enzymes that you've probably heard of that have uh, demonstrate pharmacogenetic um, characteristics. In other words, there's two different state, at least two different stable populations. CYP2D6, CYP2C19, CYP2C9, the N-acetyltransferase, other things like P-glycoprotein, some of the SLC drug transporters, uh, various different things, uh, uh, drug targets like v with warfarin also follow pharmacogenetic principles. Now, the uh, fortunate thing for all of us as pharmacists is that the CPIC, which is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, began about four or five years ago, and their goal is to try to facilitate information that we, what we know about pharmacogenetics from a research standpoint, facilitate the translation of that into clinical practice. So they looked at drugs where pharmacogenetics, they are looking at drugs where pharma, pharmacogenetics is important, and they're making specific recommendations on how to handle that, those drugs in clinical practice, depending on pharmaco, uh, pharmacogenetic results. And I've listed here on the slide, um, which I'm not going to go over in a lot of detail, but the drugs that they've reviewed to date. And they review about three, four, maybe five drugs a year. And so the drugs, ever at this list, this table is growing on a yearly basis. And then the genes where they're making recommendations on those particular drugs are listed on this particular table. So you can Google CPIC. Uh, go to their website, and they'll have all the information, the recommendations they make, depending on whether patients are poor metabolizers, extensive metabolizers, ultra-rapid metabolizers, um, whether they have other genes related to side effects or target proteins. Um, they're all in that, on that particular website. All right, uh, we're going to now talk about non-linear um, pharmacokinetics. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, in the handout on page 525, I have all of the recommendations that CPIC has made. And then you'll notice a lot of drugs that say TBA, and that's because those are drugs that they plan on reviewing, but they only review about three, four, five a year. So eventually we'll get through all those drugs. So um, case six, which is on page 526. This is CM. CM is a 55-year-old male, started on phenytoin, 200 milligrams a day, post-craniotomy, and a steady state concentration is six milligrams per liter. So if CM's KM is calculated to be five milligrams per liter, what will most likely occur if we double the dose that the patient is currently on. In other words, go from 200 a day to 400 a day. His concentration will double since phenytoin clearance is linear above the KM. His concentration will more than double since phenytoin clearance is nonlinear above the KM. And remember, we're already above the KM because his concentration is six. His concentration will not change because phenytoin is an autoinducer and clearance increases with time. 
where his concentration will increase by only 50% since phenytoin absorption decreases significantly with doses greater than 300 milligrams. All right, you guys know your nonlinear stuff. So a little bit about nonlinear elimination. This is when uh, actually every drug goes through nonlinear elimination, uh, but generally we're using drugs in concentrations that are well below the KM for that particular drug, and therefore we don't see it in clinical practice. So it's a saturation or partial saturation of the elimination pathway. We use the Michaelis-Menten equation, which you see there, the rate of elimination is equal to Vmax times the concentration over KM plus the concentration. And nonlinearity occurs when we go, get concentrations above the KM. So that's why we see it in clinical practice with phenytoin, because the KM for phenytoin is usually three, four, five milligrams per liter, and the therapeutic range is 10 to 20 milligrams per liter. So we're almost always above the KM. So the correct answer is B. His concentration will more than double since phenytoin clear is, is nonlinear above the KM. And this is the risk you have with drugs that follow nonlinear clearance, where we normally think, you know, double the dose, double the concentration. In this case, double the dose and triple or quadruple the concentration is the potential or what can occur. Uh, phenytoin is an inducer, but it's not an auto-inducer. Carbamazepine is the anti-epileptic that's an auto-inducer, if you're remembering that one of them was. And his concentration, uh, um, actually phenytoin does follow nonlinear absorption as well, in that uh, giving doses orally of more than 400 milligrams decreases absorption. So once you get above 400 milligrams of a dose of phenytoin orally, you need to um, separate that dose into two. So each individual dose is less than 400, uh, is 400 milligrams or less. In this case, we would only be going up to 400, so we're not above that um, threshold where, where absorption of phenytoin becomes nonlinear. All right, the next quick concept related to pharmacokinetics is non-compartmental pharmacokinetics. Why do we do that? Well, if you've ever done anything with compartmental pharmacokinetics, you know that creating the model is difficult. Is it a one compartment, a two compartment, a three compartment model, et cetera? You have to do complicated math, linear regression. Um, this is all for compartmental pharmacokinetics. There's a lot of assumptions you make, um, a lot of different equations that you have to follow, and you have to pick how many compartments the drug is going to follow. Non-compartmental gets rid of all that, and so it has a lot of advantages. And when you're looking at pharmacokinetic trials, uh, or results from pharmacokinetic studies, you'll notice a lot of the time they're using non-compartmental pharmacokinetics. To do that, we calculate an area under the curve. Equation is there. Area under the first moment curve. The equation is there as well. The mean resonance time. And from the mean resonance time, uh, or from those three uh, particular calculations, which we can easily do uh, based on concentrations that we've um, um, achieved or uh, analyzed, we can, we can then calculate clearance, the, volume, uh, the steady state volume, volume of distribution at steady state, K and Ka, which is the uh, absorption rate constant. So we can get all of those based on these relatively simple mathematical models. All right, that's uh, all I wanted to talk about related to um, non-compartmental pharmacokinetics. So now we're going to move back to uh, patient cases and talk a little bit about drug sampling and issues and definitions related to uh, sampling of medications. This is RK. RK is a 54-year-old female with diabetes and end-stage renal disease. She's receiving genomycin for pneumonia. And which is true about getting a sample, a um, genomycin concentration after dialysis? A, obtain the concentration immediately following hemodialysis. So take the concentration as soon as hemodialysis is done. B, wait a few hours since the concentration will decrease significantly within the few, first few hours after hemodialysis. C, wait a few hours since the concentration will increase significantly within the first few hours after hemodialysis. Or D, wait until the next day so that all of the effects of hemodialysis have abated. All right. Yep. I'm seeing good colors, those for the most part, who are uh, putting those in. So timing of... Um, 
of your, uh, when you're timing your samples, your, usually serum, but your blood, uh, blood concentrations with drugs can be important in certain situations. You need to make sure that absorption and distribu distribution is complete. And that's especially important with, for instance, digoxin, where you uh, don't want to get a digoxin concentration until at least eight hours, probably 12 hours after the dose is given orally because you have to allow it to um, be absorbed and then distribute. Otherwise, your concentration will be too high or seem to be too high. Um, and vancomycin is another one of those where you don't want to get a concentration immediately after a vancomycin, um, even though we don't do vanco peaks. But anyway, a concentration immediately after the dose because you have to allow distribution to occur. The thing we're talking about now, though, is hemodialysis. So hemodialysis is pulling drug from the blood, and you can then get a redistribution, when hemodialysis is done, of drug that's in the tissue that redistributes into the blood. And so it's best to wait um, a few hours after hemodialysis to allow that redistribution to occur. Maybe at your institution you take it immediately after hemodialysis because sometimes that's the easiest, um, log easiest time logistically to get a concentration. And if you wait a few hours, it's going to be lost and you're never going to get it. Different drugs have different requirements, although most drugs that we uh, monitor therapeutically, we, we check a serum concentration, and that's the one you need most of the time. Occasionally, you might have to get a whole blood concentration for certain drugs. So the correct answer is C, wait a few hours since the concentration will increase significantly within the first few hours after hemodialysis. All right, patient case eight then, which is on 529 of your handout. Uh, so a drug assay is touted as having high specificity and, but low sensitivity. What does that mean? High specificity, low sensitivity. Think about that. All right, now the potential answers. The assay cannot be distinguished, cannot distinguish drug from like products, other things that are similar, but it can detect extremely low concentrations. Same thing, but it can't detect extremely low concentrations. The assay can distinguish like products and also can detect extremely low concentrations or it can distinguish like products but can't detect extremely low concentrations. Excellent, all right. So let's talk a little bit about terminology with assays and I think maybe you might have uh, gotten some of this in relation to the, by, uh, the statistics uh, components of this particular course. Uh, the two, main, uh, two of the main things we look at with assays are precision and accuracy. Precision is reproducibility. That means that if you assay a blood sample 10 times, you get the same thing every time or something close. So you get five milligrams per liter every single time you do it. Doesn't mean that five is how much is actually in the sample, but it's reproducible. It tells you the same thing every time. Accuracy then is, is it telling you what's there? So if, if the concentration is 10 milligrams per liter in that sample, then the assay should tell you it's 10 milligrams per liter. And if it does, it's accurate. Um, if it tells you it's 10 over and over and over again, uh, then it's accurate and it's precise. So those are the main two terms. A lot of times in, um, in the literature, you'll see predictive performance done. Uh, predictive performance is only a measure of accuracy. And unfortunately, in predictive performance, someone decided to, to coin the terms precision and bias, even though the terms are both related to accuracy. They have nothing to do with precision. So in predictive performance, we're looking at um, what they call precision, which is basically um, uh, how close you are to the actual sample, and then bias, which is where the assay will tend to uh, be under what is actually there or over what is actually there. So an assay might tend to negative, be negatively biased. In, in, in other words, it tends to assay lower than what the actual concentration is or positively biased, where it tends to assay um, greater than what the actual concentration is. 
So that's predictive performance, and then sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is the ability to be able to differentiate the, the sample concentration different from zero. So how low can you go until you can't tell uh, whether it's zero or there's actually something there? And the lower that it can go, the more sensitive it is. And specificity is can you differentiate like substances. So can you differentiate genomycin from tobramycin? Can you differentiate amitriptyline from nortriptyline? Things that structurally are very similar. So the correct answer here is an assay with high specificity is going to be able to distinguish like products, but because it has a low sensitivity, it's not going to be able to detect extremely low concentrations. So the correct answer is D. I have some other information in your handout, which I'm not going to really spend much time over. One is assay methodology. These are the three assays that you'll see clinically, radioimmunoassays, enzyme immunoassays, and by far the most common one used clinically is fluorescence immunoassay. Those are the ones that most of the time hospitals are using when they're analyzing drugs in your patients. There are other assays which we see in the literature uh, in pharmacokinetic research studies, but not really as much clinically, including HPLC, gas chromatography, mass spec, flame uh, photometry, and bioassays. I also have a little bit of information um, in your handout related to um, Population pharmacokinetics, I don't have any case related to do that. You might want to look through that. Population pharmacokinetics is very commonly used. You'll read a lot about it in the literature. It's good when you're dealing with complicated dosing regimens, when you have drug concentrations obtained before steady state, when you only have a few drug concentrations. So it can be very useful when you don't have a well uh, designed with lots of concentrations pharmacokinetic study. It's also used clinically um, in, in terms of Bayesian pharmacokinetics, where if you're using any clinical pharmacokinetic computer software program, uh, it's probably going to be using Bayesian pharmacokinetics. So if you put in one concentration, it'll estimate the population pharmacokinetic parameters and then use those with your one concentration in your patient and come with, up with the most likely pharmacokinetic parameters, volume, volume of distribution, for instance, clearance, et cetera, in that particular patient. All right, we're going to move on now to uh, case 9 and 10, both having to do with pharmacokinetics and renal disease. This is KM. KM is an 80-year-old female. She weighs 52 kilos and is 5 foot 4. She's admitted for pyelonephritis with sepsis. She has a past medical history of um, uh, MI two times, uh, CHF, hypertension, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and a stroke. Her current serum creatinine is 0.92. Her albumin is 2.9. She's currently on trimethoprim sulfa, lisinopril, digoxin, furosemide, cimetidine, uh, Tylenol, calcium, and carvedilol. Sort of a weird drug regimen, but you'll see why I did that in a second. So what is the best assessment of KM's renal function? Her serum creatinine is in the normal range, and therefore no dosage adjustments are necessary. Because of her age, KM has some degree of renal dysfunction, and doses may need to be adjusted. Because of the pyelonephritis, KM has renal dysfunction, and doses may need to be adjusted. Or her serum creatinine is in the normal range, but her BUN is elevated, so doses may need to be adjusted. Hmm. All right. So let's talk about monitoring... A lot of you got the correct answer. Oh, the second case then, think about this one. Which of KM's drugs may alter serum creatinine concentrations? Lisinopril and digoxin, trimethoprim sulfa and cimetidine, furosemide and calcium, or acetaminophen and carvedilol? All right, so let's go through this. Um, first of all, what do we do in patients with renal disease? Well, we try to estimate their uh, renal function. 
And we do that using creatinine, which is a substance that we all produce all the time on a constant amount. And so it's excellent for monitoring renal function. It's also just primarily filtered in the kidneys. There's some secretion, but primar primarily elimination is through filtration in the kidneys. So we can use it as a measure of um, GFR. The best, um, and that's what we do, we use creatinine clearance as an estimate of GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, the best thing to do is a 24-hour urine, uh, but that's very, it can be somewhat cumbersome, complicated, and not quick, obviously. It takes over 24 hours. So because of that, we do, we use creatinine clearance estimation. So now we're estimating creatinine clearance, which is estimating GFR. So it's sort of like a two-step uh, removed from what we really want to know. But common equations you'll see are the Jellif equation, Cockroft and Galt, which is classic, which is what we're going to use most of the time. And then there's some pediatric equations as well, all of which are in your handout. And then what's now used um, primarily for uh, monitoring patients with renal dysfunction, um, people with CKD, um, we are now doing GFR estimates, and those two equations are MDRD and CKD-EPI. CKD-EPI is the one that's used now because it uh, better estimates GFRs at higher ranges than MDRD. But these are the equations that directly estimate GFR, and so you're not doing an estimate of the estimate, but these equations are primarily used to, to estimate um, patients' renal functions as you monitor them through the process of worsening renal function when they have CAKD, C, uh, CKD, not so much when you're adjusting, monitoring and adjusting drugs. So for monitoring and adjusting drugs, it's still recommended to use Cockcroft and Galt and not one of these newer estimates of GFR. So some factors that influence estimates of creatinine clearance include disease states and clinical conditions, um, those are all listed in your handout, things that increase or decrease muscle mass or um, worsen liver function. Diet can also have an impact depending on your meat intake. Um, and finally, some drugs can also uh, directly interact with creatinine, um, a few of which I've listed in your handout. Uh, trimethoprim is one of those, cimetidine, aspirin um, can interact and falsely elevate your uh, serum creatinine concentrations. And those are all in your handout um, on page 534. Um, dronetarone is also um, on that list. So drug dosing in renal disease, uh, generally we don't have to adjust loading doses in renal disease. So you give the same loading dose you would in someone with normal renal function. One um, example where that's not the case is digoxin. We're going to get to a question uh, um, with that in just a bit. But it's maintenance doses then that we have to adjust based on renal, uh, renal dysfunction. And we can either change the dosing interval, so give the same dose over a longer interval, or we can change the dose, so give the same interval but decrease the dose. And depending on the drug, one of those is better than the other frequently um, in, when you're making that decision. So let's talk about this patient. Uh, this patient's uh, creatinine clearance. I have the equation listed there using Cockcroft and Galt because, again, that's what's recommended when you're making a drug, adjust, drug dosing adjustments is to use Cockcroft and Galt. Uh, the current recommendations are to use weight in the equation, so use weight divided by 72, total body weight if the BMI is low, ideal body weight if the BMI is normal, or total body weight plus 40% of fat weight if the BMI is greater than 25. Those are the current recommendations for weight. And then obviously females, um, I'm sure you all remember, multiplied by 0.85. So her creatinine clearance is 42. Generally, if a creatinine clearance is less than 50, we need to be looking to see if drugs need to be adjusted. Some drugs even at higher creatinine clearances, but most drugs at less than 50, then you need to uh, look up and figure out whether drugs need to be adjusted. Now, if we use an estimate of GFR, KM's uh, estimate of GFR, according to CKD-EPI, is about 59. And you can see that there's quite a bit of difference here. Also notice the, the, um, the units are different. So Cockcroft and Galt, the units are mils per minute. Whereas with the GFR equations, the units are mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. So you are adjusting to a quote-unquote normal-sized person with the GFR estimates. 
So if I take the fact that this is a small woman and adjust according to her body surface area, then still the GFR is quite a bit different than the Cockroft and Galt. And you'll see that happen quite commonly, especially in people who are not close to the normal uh, size person. You're going to see differences in Cockroft and Galt because it's the only equation that we have, really, to estimate renal function that includes body weight in the equation. So the correct answer is because of her age, she's 80, so if we look at the Cockcroft and Gald equation, you get penalized. Uh, after you turn the age, thir- uh, age of 30, you start to lose about a mil per minute per year. So that's why as you get older and older, just even if you have quote unquote normal renal function, it's still going to be poor because you've aged and you've lost about a mil per minute per year. So because of her age, KM has some degree of renal dysfunction and doses may need to be adjusted depending on the drug. And what about the drugs? Well, I alluded to this fact. Two drugs that could alter serum concentration, um, trimethoprim does and cimetidine does. So those could falsely elevate her serum creatinine, leading leading you to believe that she has poor renal function than she actually does. Okay, uh, case 11. Case 11 is, um, is SJ. SJ is a 55-year-old male with fungemia, and past medical history includes hepatic dysfunction with ascites but no encephalopathy. He started on caspofungin, and the caspofungin package insert tells you that doses need to be decreased in patients with a child Pew score of 7 to 9. So... The question becomes then, what is this patient's child Pew score? I've given you some labs there, AST, ALT, but really the major labs you're going to need for child Pew are bilirubin, albumin, um, PT, and then I've given you some other patient characteristics that you need to look at. So the question is, what is his child Pew score? 3, 5, 8, or 11? Hmm. I'll skip through this quickly because you're probably looking at the um, looking at the child how to calculate child P score on 536 potentially. So drug drug dosing in hepatic disease it's not as sophisticated as renal disease. Uh, obviously, you need to be careful in people with liver dysfunction for drugs that are hepatically metabolized. Usually, though, we do the very unsophisticated things uh, thing of starting with a low dose and then slowly titrating based on patient um, patient effect. Um, but there is a child Pew score. It's sort of like um, a creatinine clearance for liver dysfunction. Not really, but it's sort of like that, which can help you with some drugs. Um, it's a scoring system based on encephalopathy, which this patient does not have, ascites, bili- which this patient does have, um, bilirubin, albumin, and PT. And you can see that if you're normal in every category, you get a point. So the lowest child Pew score you can have is a 5. And for this patient, he got zero for encephalopathy, uh, or sorry, one point for encephalopathy, two points for ascites, because he had some ascites, so we're up to three. Um, His bilirubin was, sorry, I'm going to have to go back here. His bilirubin was 1.8, so that puts him in that middle category, two more points, we're up to five. His albumin was 2.9, two more points, we're up to seven. And his PT was not very many seconds above normal. I think it was 14 or something. So one more point. So we're up to a total of eight. So the correct answer is eight. And again, with caspofungin, the, the do- it's recommended to adjust the dose with, in patients with a child pew of between seven to nine. So in him, we would need to adjust the dose. All right, before I get into some specific drug characteristics, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about pharmacodynamics. And um, we're going to talk somewhat about hysteresis. And you go, hysteresis, what are you you talking about? Uh, But hysteresis has been known to um, pop up on the exam. I'm not saying it's going to, it will this year, but it's been known to pop up. So I wanted to make sure you at least were uh, a little familiar with it because it's not hard to understand and you can then get that question correct. So which of the following is a reason for a drug to follow clockwise hysteresis? Formation of an active metabolite, delay in equilibrium between the blood and the site of action, 
tolerance or increased sensitivity with time. Hmm. So ponder on that, and let me talk about hysteresis, and then we'll come back, and um, you'll be able to answer that question then. Here's just a few things that you might see related to pharmacodynamics. So opposed to pharmacokinetics, which is sort of what the body does to the drug. It absorbs it, distributes it, metabolizes it, excretes it. Pharmacodynamics is the flip to that, what the drug does to the body. So it's the relationship between concentration and the response to that particular drug. The Hill equation is the classic pharmacodynamic equation. You can see it looks very similar to the Michaelis-Menten equation. It's a very, it's a similar type of equation um, where the effect then or the pharmacologic response is equal to Emax times the concentration divided by EC50, which is like a KM plus the concentration. And then hysteresis loops are uh, where concentrations late after a dose produce an effect that's different from that produced by the same concentration soon after the dose. So let's talk about that. This is a um, clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise hysteresis loop. And you see when you give a drug then um, and the concentration starts to go up, you get a particular effect based on that concentration. But if you wait over time, what you notice is the same concentration, so this concentration is the same as this concentration, those same concentrations have significantly different effects. So early after the dose, you have a lower effect with that concentration, and later after that dose with that same concentration, as the concentration starts to come back down, you have a much higher effect. So this can be due to increased sensitivity over time, So the receptor becomes more sensitive over time. It could be because you're forming an active metabolite, and that active metabolite, which is not part of the concentration of the drug when you assay it, is having an effect. It could be a delay in the equilibrium between plasma concentrations and the concentration of the site, and this happens with digoxin. Um, But those are some things potentially that can happen with counterclockwise hysteresis. Clockwise hysteresis is... The, the exact opposite, where early after a dose, similar concentrations have more of an effect, and then uh, later on after the dose, even at the same concentration as the concentration then starts to come back down, you have much less effect. This could be the opposite of increased sensitivity, which is tolerance, or the formation of an inhab- inhibitory metabolite, or equilibrium is reached faster between arterial blood and the site of action versus venous blood, which is generally where we're sampling from, and the site of action. And some examples of this are pseudoephedrine and cocaine. So the correct answer then here is if it's clockwise hysteresis, that means that we're seeing tolerance occur and we're getting less of an effect later on after the dose with the similar concentration. All right, I'm going to finish with um, three patient cases very quickly related to specific drug information that is located on table 10 um, on page 539 in your handout. So we're going to start, first of all, with phenytoin. PL is a 45-year-old male with chronic uh, renal failure. He's on 400 milligrams a day of phenytoin for seizures. The phenytoin concentration is 13.6. His albumin concentration is 4.2. The question is, what do you recommend to do with his dose with a concentration of 13.6? Keep the dose the same. So make no changes in his current dosing regimen. His concentration is fine. Keep the total dose the same, but change the regimen to 200 BID. So split the 400 once a day into 200 BID. Increase the dose for better seizure control, his concentration is too low, or decrease the dose to prevent toxicity. Answers? All right, sort of a hodgepodge. So the normal therapeutic range of phenytoin is 10 to 20. You do have to remember, though, that that you can have interactions with protein binding. So patients with low albumin or patients with chronic renal failure Um, will have higher free concentrations at the same total concentrations. So um, you have to make those adjustments based on these equations, which are in the handout for patients with 
low albumin, patients with chronic renal failure, and patients who are in chronic renal failure and have low albumin. And so the correct answer is D, decrease the dose, because the total concentration of 13.6 in a patient with chronic renal failure is actually double that. So it's about 27, which is too high when we go through those equations, too high, and we need to adjust the dose down. Okay, this is NR, patient case 14, a 63-year-old male in renal insufficiency and AFib, started on DIG for rate control, which is correct. Loading dose should stay the same, but decrease the maintenance. Loading dose decrease, keep the maintenance the same. Don't do anything to either dose, or both doses need to be changed. Hmm. I alluded to this earlier in the presentation. Something unique about digoxin is, yes, it's renally eliminated, so you need to decrease doses in patients with renal dysfunction, but also the volume of distribution is decreased in patients with renal dysfunction. So usually, maintenance, usually loading doses are not adjusted in renal failure, but with DIG, you have to lower the loading dose and lower the maintenance dose. So the correct answer is D, both doses need to be changed. And finally, PP is a 34-year-old male with um, cerebral palsy and UTIs. He's given tobramycin once daily, so quote-unquote once daily dosing or high-dose extended er interval dosing. We do that to take advantage of aminoglycosides concentration-dependent killing because it's more efficacious than standard dosing, because it does not require concentration monitoring, or because it will not cause nephrotoxicity. So why do we do high-dose extended interval aminoglycosides? Um, so there's information on there. It's generally recommended in that it can decrease toxicity. It won't eliminate toxicity. Um, and potentially it can improve uh, uh, efficacy because it takes advantage of the aminoglycosides concentration-dependent killing. More information in your handout on these specific drugs which we monitor therapeutically. And that's all I have.